to say something I'm not supposed to say. That's okay, so. that's the whole point. The Islamic Republic of Iran. Obama was the worst president in modern American history. Welcome to Unfiltered with Adam Sopros. I'm here with my very good friend, Aaron Boris. Pleasure to have you on Unfiltered. Thanks, Adam. You had me at hello. <laughs> Where are we? We are currently at Shiva Medical Center. We are in a rehab center that's been essentially repurposed for the wars. Most of the critically wounded soldiers, I should say, are ending up at Sheba with some of the best doctors that you can find. Give me two minutes about your background. Well, I'm 33. I moved here from Long Island, New York. Grew up in a very sheltered, beautiful, crimeless, awesome suburban setting in Long Island. I was fortunate enough to be in a place where I could foster a very strong Jewish identity, one that corresponded also with a love for Israel. And I grew up wanting to come here, move here, do something impactful here. So I moved from Long Island to Israel when I was 19 years old, and I've been here ever since. Built an entire life for myself, the IDF, doing combat, a kibbutz, driving a tractor, working as a bartender, IDC Herzliya, getting a degree in marketing and business, and now eight years in high tech, where I built myself up to be the chief marketing officer at a very successful AI startup here in Israel called Hiro. Uh, which I'm fortunate enough to have been a part of now for five years. Just got married. Yeah, and we got married. She's Israeli. Um, we celebrated in Israel with about 400 friends, many of whom flew in from abroad, uh, which now seems just like it was a decade ago. I mean, it just seems like it, it was, was in a, a totally, you know, that's when the world was right side up. Quite an amazing experience to see everyone at that wedding, especially now with the context of, okay, we were, we've kind of entered a new phase in Israel's lifetime. Were a lot of the guys that you were serving with in a similar situation like yourself, having just gone through some type of like, life cycle event change? Yeah, absolutely. You got injured, you were shot three times, and uh, you were injured because you went to save your commander, who you didn't know had been fatally shot in the head when you went to go and save him. Correct. So I have two questions for you. One, I'd really like to know if you regret doing that now knowing that he was already dead. My commander was also one of two soldiers who was injured on the ground. He was in the worst condition, which I assessed correctly. He was killed. I just didn't know that. I thought he was critically injured, and it turns out that he was actually, he was killed. You know, if I had known he had been killed, then I probably would have ran out to save my comms person. I'm, I'm fairly sure that that's, you know, what I would have done instead. So uh, either way, you know, it's hard, to, it's hard to play back these moments. It's hard to play back these scenarios and ask what if. You know, I have a lot of luck in this situation that in, in many ways, it's like however many times I play this back, the different constellations, the different things I could have done to change the outcome, it, it's like no matter what, I, I couldn't have saved my officer's life. Mm -hmm. The only thing I could do, I guess, is honor him by trying to run out and, and get him inside as quickly as possible, whether dead or alive. And I think that that's um, something that I'm also lucky I get to live with you know, the pride in knowing that I ran out to try to do that, while not of having to give up my, my limbs or my life. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, um, there's a level of luck there that's not to be taken for granted, for sure. It would be one thing if something had happened and then you were living with feeling like you didn't do everything that you could have done. Exactly. You probably have this sense of solace knowing that you did every single possible thing that you could have. I do. And I think in a way that's it's almost like uh, unfair that in too many ways do I feel lucky in this scenario and in too many ways do I feel that my officer had no chance and was the opposite of lucky. If you can remember, what went through your head in that split second when you were like, I, I have to grab this guy, like I have to save my CO? I think it's uh, not trivial. And it's not obvious. We like to think of ourselves in a certain light. And we can do that up until a certain point because usually we won't get tested to the point where we have to show whether or not what we thought about ourselves was true. So for me, I can't say to you, Adam, I knew that in this situation I would do something brave or I knew in this situation that I would try to save my, my officer. I can tell you that the Israeli spirit is one of complete simplicity, but it's beautiful. It's hurt, help, hurt, help. And I like to embody the Israeli spirit in almost everything I do, and I think that that was the same, if not tenfold, on the day that this happened. Israelis help in all types of situations, right, all over the world, even including our enemies, including people who treat Israel like a pariah. We show up. This is an officer who I cared about deeply, and he was hurt. And so I had an instinct which was to help. I was shooting at the school, which, by the way, had no civilians in it or anything like that. They, it was completely taken over by Hamas operatives. And I was shooting at the school to give cover fire. And when I 
collected my thoughts and when enough time has pa had passed that I thought that I had assessed the situation well enough, I think it was about two minutes after, and I looked at my commander. I was sure that he was hurt and I was sure that I could help. And it's a very naive way of thinking, but it's also, in my opinion, the right way of thinking and I'm happy that that's what I did. And so, so it's you your know, question, no. Your story um, has been told numerous times. People have kind of bombarded you coming here. Your, your name, the Fresh Prince of Tel Aviv, has kind of become quite famous now. What's the main thing that you haven't said out loud yet that you just want to scream? I'm a normal guy. I believe in peace. I always did. Even though I heard all the stories coming out of Gaza, even though I understood a Palestinian population that's being radicalized and educated towards only hate and violence essentially since 2005 but even before that I went into Gaza still under the impression that peace was possible. One thing I think you know that I would take the guy next to me and shake him awake uh, from what I know now having gone into Gaza is, is that I don't believe that anymore and I think that that's extremely unfortunate but I'm not sure that the current population the way that that hate has been indoctrined in their upbringing, the way that the textbooks have been reformatted to fit Hamas's narrative or in general radical Islam's narrative. I just don't think that there's room for peace. I don't think that this is a civilian population that's meant for peace. Instead, I think that the, the opposite. I think that your average human being in Gaza is bent on destroying Israel and innocent life that comes with that. And the opposite, Israelis are hell-bent on preserving life, whether it's ours or, or theirs, despite that hate and despite that violent you know, tendency towards us. And, you know, going house to house and seeing the terror, the terror-laden infrastructure of that place, just seeing what an average Gazan's home is like, I think that the capacity for peace doesn't exist right now. I remember when you called me 48 hours before you were injured, and you had said to me, the worst was behind you, based on what you had seen. And one of the things that you told me was that you saw keys in keyholes of doors that were being left by families for Hamas to use them as military bases or to gather as troops. Right. Do you think the biggest misconception about Gaza is that there are people that want peace? Do you think the entire two million plus people have been totally radicalized? Or, or do you think that there is some part of their population that wants peace with Israel? I think that peace has been hijacked. I think peace has been hijacked by Hamas, by the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, by radical Gazan civilians who maybe aren't a part of those organizations specifically. And I think that saying that every single Gazan is anti-peace is wrong. It's not true. It's factually inaccurate. What I mean by what I'm saying is the general population, when you have 75% or 80%, right, 8 out of 10 people who aren't pro-peace, who would actually choose killing innocent civilians on the other side, Jews, Israelis, versus prosperity, perseverance of their own goals for statehood, etc. When you have those choices being made by the majority of the population, it's very difficult to imagine that the minority is somehow in a place where peace can be upheld or peace can be the overall goal of the Palestinian people. It's an unfortunate situation where I think that those who do understand that uh, peace is how Palestinians will, will find prosperity, not war with Israel or acts of terror against Israeli civilians, while there may be that minority, they're going to be outnumbered and surely outvoiced by, by those that by feel that differently. Problem and those who are championing what was one of the most you know, heinous acts in the history of the Jewish people's timeline, which was October 7th. And seeing all of that firsthand, like you said, being shot at out of an UNRWA school, absolutely. But it's more going house to house, being in about 20 different houses, I want to say, in my time in Gaza, and seeing that 19 of those houses in some way were connected to terrorism. So keys in the door is one thing, munitions in children's closets right, is another a thing. house that was built as an entryway for a tunnel. Yeah. Right. Like, so a decoy, you, right, essentially. A, a decoy, a house that right, was a Valuable resources so, that should go so to we, an impoverished we, population, but instead it's being used to prop up terror. And that's time and time again where the resources are going, right? So in that's, short, you're saying that most of the things that are considered off-limits by the UN and by international law were being hijacked by the enemy regularly. Absolutely. So then why do you think there's this huge misconception by such a large body of people that, you know, the Israeli Army One is this elite fighting killing machine not made of, uh, you know, uh, reservists who are not everyday soldiers, you know, who served once when they were younger, but then go back for training every so often. I mean, when was the last time you trained? I think it's important to kind of, even before answering that question, just talk a little bit about what, what the hell is the reserves, right? We talk about Miloim, we talk about the reserves, and I think for uh, people who live abroad who don't really know the IDF too well, uh, the concept's a little bit foreign to them. So. 
when we talk about the reserves, it's not like uh, the U.S. Army reserves where, you know, um, th this is a person's career and they go on tours. And um, this is an army of normal average Joes. Okay, this is an army of your, your you know, totally average civilians who are uh, trying to live day-to-day, -day, you know, existence. They're not focused on combat. Their uh, careers are not built around, you know, training and, and uh, missions and things like that. Of course, you have the elite special forces the like that. perception of the IDF is the exact opposite? Absolutely. I think the world's perception of the IDF to those who are less knowledgeable about the situation here and unfortunately who are some of like the TikTok educated folks out there, um, which, you know, I don't actually blame some of them. It's like, uh, you know, for us learning about something in a very foreign country that doesn't affect us uh, deep down. And these are people who look at the IDF and the people in it uh, like we're bred for some kind of conquest, like we're bred for some kind of, you know, uh, idiots like Sean King will call us the, the Israeli occupation forces. It's more than just Sean. It's, it's, it's probably every single Hollywood leftist that's out in the world today. You have John Cusack, who's constantly calling you guys baby killers. There's a, there's a lot of misinformed people. I want to go right. back, though, just for a second. So we, as reservists, are meant to train at least once every year. Uh -huh. Now they've broken it down so that we actually do shorter trainings, but they're more accurate towards the idea so of what future missions war, would be. Before this war, when was the last time you, you went in for any type of training? How long has it been? Personally, the last time I had faced combat or trained, either of those things, was two and a half years before October 7th. So you, you went in without two years of any type of updating in your training or that's, anything like that. That's correct. I would assume that most people really do not even consider that to be necessarily even safe, let alone it's completely the opposite of what many people would assume the Israeli army is. So you can make the argument that, right, it's, uh, it's less than ideal. My point uh, is that you're not some born and bred killer and that you're an average everyday guy looking to live his life. It's really your average Joe. So it's a cousin, a brother, a son, this or that. It's a farmer, it's an engineer at, uh, at Intel, it's a salesperson from a telecom company, it's a teacher for, from a preschool. I mean, we're talking about people who are in combat because they have to be, not because they necessarily want to be. They're in combat and they're brave, but they're brave by necessity, not necessarily by choice. Do you see what I'm saying? It's a survivalist nation. I think that people look at the IDF and think that because the Palestinians have been through, you know, such hard times or that they don't have their own infrastructure and their own uh, sophisticated military and their own defense systems, they're automatically painted as the underdog. And by extension, the IDF is then painted as the bully. Mm -hmm. And this is nonsense. We're not the bully. We prioritize defense. They prioritize terror. We prioritize the buildup of a military that can stand on the borders and defend the country when called upon. Right? But it doesn't mean that your average reservist is, I don't know, bred for war or seeking war or the opposite, quite the opposite. Most Israelis don't want this at all. Most Israelis want to be home with their families, growing their families, protecting, you know, what is uh, uh, their own prosperity, right? Their own careers, their own growth. I mean, these are the things that people are trying to get back to now. People have been stripped away from what they know and forced to go into Gaza, my friends included, myself included, to fight because Hamas has lured us into this war, having committed the atrocities that they did on October 7th, having kidnapped as many people as they did on October 7th, and God knows what fate awaits those that are still trapped in Gaza. You worked with somebody that had four people that were taken hostage, Abby Owen, who runs the Nouveau Correct. group. And um, I want to know, as somebody that was in the fighting and, and, and lived it, do you think any of the hostage deals have been detrimental to the fighting or to the progress of the war or, or possibly put soldiers in harm's way? Do you think like maybe some things could have been done differently? I'm not looking for a, you support this, you support yeah. that. I'm more concerned with like, do you think the campaign has moved forward to get them back? Do you think like, things could have been done a little differently? It's un unfair for me to even answer that based on the fact that these are real people, real families, brothers, cousins, moms, fathers who are getting their family members back, their loved ones back. and. I do believe that those deals were necessary. What was like the Mind you, I believe that as a normal, grounded, average human being. As a soldier, of course those deals were detrimental to what was going on in the ground operation. Interesting. I was here in this medical center, biting my nails, you know, going crazy, metaphorically speaking, just f***ing, you know, I was apeshit, you know, thinking about our guys, our soldiers, stuck 
in a holding pattern in a place where now there are Gazan men moving freely dressed as civilians, clearly not, in the north of Gaza, closing on our position. If you're looking at it from a military perspective, the hostage deals are not advantageous to a good ground campaign whatsoever. So However... As a, no, but as a soldier, you're saying that Israel was basically putting soldiers in harm's way in order to get the hostages back because that's how important it was. Absolutely. What prompted us to go into Gaza in the first place? Exactly. The mission was very clear. There are a few bullets in, in the mission detail. Destroy the terrorist infrastructure, oust Hamas, find hostages. I mean, it's really just three bullet points, right? I think that we would have gone in anyway, okay. because even the, the trail of dead that was left in Israel is a catastrophic loss. So mm -hmm. even without hostages, I think we needed to go into Gaza and neutralize a threat, which is Hamas. If you don't, all you do is empower them to believe that they could and should and would, et cetera, do it again. So of course, I think that it was necessary to go in regardless, based on the weight of the massacre that occurred on October 7th. Remember in 2014, Operation Protective Edge, which I was also a reservist in, Operation Protective Edge was, was because of three boys who mm -hmm. were kidnapped and killed. You know, if we talk about the weight of, uh, of numbers, of course, not that their lives are any, yeah. in any way uh, it, trivialized by what I'm saying, but I mean that if you just look at it by weight of numbers, then yes, <laughs> like a thousandfold, we should yeah. have gone into Gaza. So being an American Israeli, I grew up in the United States for September 11th. So I was in the United States for September 11th. Where, where were you in, on September 11th? That's such a, everyone knows where they were, right? I was in um, Spanish class. I was in the sixth grade and, um, and I was pulled out of class because my dad worked in New York City mm. and he could see smoke from his building too. Um, and we were all sent home at some point during that day. Where were you on September 11th? I was 11th? in ninth grade, Mr. Miller's history class sitting next to Shana Smilitz. Nice. Wow, so, we've, we've lived through both September 11th and October 7th, which is crazy. Right, in both yeah, countries, in as both countries, both as a citizen. And both as Americans that immigrated to Israel. The values that are protected by America, in my opinion, are similar values to what we protect in Israel, except that in Israel it's exacerbated by the fact that our neighbors want to all kill us. And in Israel we're actually a survivalist nation, where in the U.S. it's less of a survivalist nation. So if terrorism roamed the earth right freely the u.s would would be affected by it but still it's not a country that's going to you know completely um uh, implode um, it's not like mexico and canada are going to invade the u.s and in israel unfortunately if terrorism roams freely on our borders and affects us too much internally actually israel can implode um, and that's, of course, what the Arab world would love to see. Despite all of the conspiracy theories and nonsense that's come out since September 11th, if you believe that Al-Qaeda was responsible for blowing up the Twin Towers, and you believe that Al-Qaeda is a symptom of horrible radicalization of Islam and terrorism at large, then you should be against radicalization of Islam and terrorism at large, which means you should be against Hamas and most of the villains that are in Israel's current uh, uh, state of affairs, Hezbollah, for instance, now the Houthis. The fact that Americans would support those organizations blows my mind, having again been an American living through September 11th. Don't you think it's, and, uh, it's, it's not really Americans, it's, it's really people that are younger than us that didn't live through these things, that never had to experience it. it. It was 20 years ago. It's not that wild to ask a question of where the hell is the proper education of the younger generation to understand the difference between right and wrong, freedom and the uh, oppression of freedom, which is what well, radical Islam entails and what terrorism essentially is, is a part of. Right? How has America not maintained its own narrative? Some of the pitfalls of being such a strong democracy and such a, a beacon of freedom is that essentially you have to leave it for America to self-correct. Uh, powers that be, the enemies of the United States that are very much keeping their populations in check and you have the United States that's susceptible unfortunately to corruption. Uh, I believe that self-correction will happen. I believe that equilibrium exists. I think that freedom is better than anything at all and that the United States will find its way again. The fact that Russia and, and China are selling weapons to Hamas doesn't surprise me in the slightest because Israel is America's greatest ally in the Middle East and any destabilization of Israel is a celebration for Russia and China and Iran and this, this new axis of evil forming. This is a win for them. It's better for them that Israel is weakened. It's better for them that America looks weak backing Israel. All of these things are true. Except both of those countries hate radical Islam. Unless they can right. wield it for themselves until they don't Where did you go to want it anymore. Kind of hitting on what you're saying about China and Russia wanting to weaken America through Israel and you see how the next generation that's 20 years younger than us, 15 years younger, 10 years younger, who are all in school right now, are mostly siding with 
the radicals, if you saw what happened, I think it was at Rutgers the other day, two kids came out in a full freedom fighter outfit, Hamas freedom fighter outfit, wearing a kafia as a mask. I mean, making basically what looked like a terrorist statement about how things should be taken care of on campus and the fact that somebody was called out for, I think, releasing the name of a student leader of the Students for Christian Palestine. They're lucky they didn't do that in Arkansas. They would have been shot in the head. That's my point. Like, don't, do you not see, like, this rat? I mean, like, for you at this age, and, like, you know, you're married, you're obviously going to want to have kids soon. Like, this is, like, these are your future children's contemporaries. How frightening is that? Yeah. I think that it all goes back to an ideology that has spread its ugly head in the last four years, maybe? Oppressor versus oppressed ideology. It doesn't uh, work. It doesn't work. It's a simplistic ideology that you can shove. Uh, it's similar to what we talked about, the underdog versus the bully, right? But the oppressor versus oppressed ideology essentially claims that all forms of resistance are permissible. Uh, if someone has been in some way bullied or marginalized or had crimes against them committed, right? It, it doesn't matter the timeline. It's like oppressed, so resist. And the oppressor is the bad guy. So colonizers are oppressors. The United States is now, right? The United States is, of course, a, a colonizer. The, 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 big um, devil. the big devil supports colonizers. Funny, they're, to them, and, they're the, the, the head of the snake. And to us, Iran is the head of the snake. Right. It's, it's, it's very so you have, a, but you have a younger generation that is growing up believing that the United States does so much wrong that the country itself is, to not, is not to be believed. And the people who perpetrate terrorist acts against the United States are in fact freedom fighters versus our own soldiers, U.S. military soldiers, who are in fact seeking to release the oppressed from dictatorships, from organizations like Al-Qaeda that wreak havoc on their own civilian populations. That is backwards thinking, and that's born from that same ideology. So, right, right, so it doesn't surprise me that they don't support their own country and their own right, American values, because they also don't support Israel's values. And to me, again, they're both linked, and we talked about that before as well. I'm convinced that you can get most of these people who are protesting in the streets to scream things like, we want vasectomies, because they don't actually know what half of these words mean. Like, I'm convinced that you can get them to protest about anything and use any words. For people to join, join these protests and they're paying people to actually be there as well? It doesn't surprise me. Yeah, Although, unfortunately, I, I don't know that I don't know how many people you actually need to pay to be there because I feel like there is such a young population that's so impressionable, that's so uh, vulnerable to seeing pictures of dead babies and then automatically going to uh, to submit to the outcry of the underdog or the Palestinian people. So it's not surprising. It's really one version of secular and then one version of extreme religious and it's some type of radical Islamic, you know, person or some type of radical, progressive, left, secular, very uneducated individuals when it comes to the world who basically, you know, I always like to use the great example that when they were throwing Syrians into premature homes during the Syrian civil war, Americans were arguing about gender neutral bathrooms. And I assume that most of the people out here were the ones who were arguing for gender neutral bathrooms in every single place possible. What gives me hope, and uh, it's pretty sad that this is what would give me hope, is that I actually think most of it's related to ignorance. And that's what I wanted to say before. The people who are shouting for intifada, I believe that they don't actually know what that word means. And there are a bunch of videos of uh, Jewish activists walking around asking them to define what an intifada is, and they can't. Um, the reason I don't believe that they would actually know what it means is just because I'm still hard-pressed and maybe naive to believe that your average U.S. citizen or even your average protester at these Palestinian rallies would support something as ridiculous as suicide bombings on a bus that takes away the lives of just innocent families on their way to work well, or college, etc. And the uh, using rape as a as a tool now. I mean, unless it's not a Jewish woman. I, I mean, like it's their their value system. The, the extremists in those ranks, absolutely. They are they're the I mean, extremists in those ranks. There are two things that really mirror what happened right before World War Two. One, the dehumanization of the international Jew. And I say the international Jew because I mean the Jewish people, not the way Henry Ford used to say the international Jew. Okay. Got it. Two, the veneration of international bodies that have become completely castrated and inept, like the UN, which is exactly what happened with the League of Nations and all the other right. international bodies prior to World War II. Right, dismantled, and then of course that was a catalyst for, for the... Right. I saw somebody write something the other day on social media, and they said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. That's a good line. And what do you think is the worst part of the entire situation? A PR war that Israel is clearly losing. There's... Oh, we're losing the PR war? Uh, just in case you didn't know. Would you like to watch the news with me later? Maybe, maybe something has changed in the last five minutes, but I don't think so. Wow. 
I actually only watch Scooter Braun's uh, Instagram, so I, I thought we were winning. Uh, yeah, no, I hate to bring it to you. It's <laughs> terrible out there. But uh, what do you think is the best thing for Israel right now? Positive. If you look at a huge silver lining post October 7th, and you look at Sheba even as a microcosm of all of this, where we are right now in this rehabilitation center, you see from all walks of life people coming together in unity to fight what was just one of the most horrific you know, acts in, in our nation's history and the Jewish tribe's history. I think what Israel has going for it right now is strength and unity, which I couldn't have said existed in the last few years especially. But politics aside, that's what makes this so amazing to be able to say. It's irrelevant. The U.S., right, is not in that state. The U.S., I feel like, as an American, you, know, you see the United States and it doesn't feel like there's anything that will unite that country ever again, including something as big and, and, and horrible as September 11th. And in, in Israel, what we're seeing is that people have actually come together and there's a new sense of, of nationalism, um, but healthy nationalism, right? The, the type of, of unity that transcends politics, that goes beyond uh, religion, that goes beyond right, socioeconomic class. And I think that that's something you'd want to see for a country that has quite a challenging road ahead of itself. I think Israel is poised to make its most uh, powerful and impressive jump yet. And that comes from the fact that we as a nation and as a people have come together throughout this tragedy. Are you interested in visiting the States once you've healed up? Or do you feel like it's become, you know... I no, I, I plan... Who are visiting right now say they feel safer in Israel than they do here. They oh, I don't think I'll feel safe at all, but of course I plan to visit the United States. I grew up there and I don't, you know, have any qualms about going back. And I especially look forward to going back and speaking, even though it'll be challenging and oftentimes nauseating to see the type of uh, a pushback I'll get. But I look forward to speaking and trying to challenge some of the current generation's viewpoints on this topic, on the subject of Israel, on the subject of America's you know, place within our timeline and our fight against Hamas. And, and absolutely, I want to go back to America and fight the bigotry that's spreading. Do, do you think it's unfair that the army does not have a unit for injured soldiers to receive sponge pads? <laughs> <laughs> you yourself can be a solo unit, Sayeret sponge bath. And you can just go around and, sure enough, give sponge baths to, uh, so to injured soldiers. I, I personally, I wouldn't accept one from you, Not from me. but I would recommend that the people I like least here would get one from you. And, and I think that that would be an awesome use of your time, uh, more than this podcast, for sure. So, so it leads me to my second question. Do, do you want a sponge bath? Would you like bubbles? Uh, actually, um, <laughs> I've got a, I've got a run. I've got another meeting. Uh, uh, thank, thank you so much. Thanks for sitting with me. Thank you. Like, um, I think everybody will be very interested to hear what you have to say. Um, this I appreciate is it. With Adam Scott Bellos and my very special guest, the French Prince of Tel Aviv, Aaron Morris. And uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Thank you.